All right, good morning. I have nine o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Stacy Daniel, and I serve as the section chief for ELA and languages. Um, welcome to the unpacking the ELD standard session um, that's focused um, for content area teachers. Karen and Laura are going to be your presenters today, and they're going to introduce themselves in just a minute. Um, but in case you hadn't looked at the summer conference um, program, this session is really focused on exploring and engaging in some activities that are designed to really help you understand the ELD standards and the language expectations. And then you're also going to be contributing to a shared artifact that hopefully will help you facilitate your implementation beginning in the fall of next school year. So with that being said, um, again, I'm going to go ahead and put the tiny URL to the slide deck in the chat again for you um, in case you want to follow along. And I'm going to turn it over to Karen and Laura to start us off. Okay, thank you, Stacy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on your summer uh, morning. And we want to welcome you to our unpacking the 2022 ELD standard session. We hope you're ready to unpack the new standards with us and learn how to use these wonderful documents while implementing uh, and new ELD standards. And I know it's going to be your ESL colleagues that will be using these more, but we really want you to be familiar with it because um, it will definitely help you to grow your students in their English language development as well. Well, next, I want to ask Karen if she'll introduce herself. Hi, yes, I am Karen Solis, and I teach middle school in uh, multilinguals in Gaston County. I've been on the support team since 2010, and I'm so happy to be here with you today and, um, and go over these new standards that we have. Thank you, Karen, and I'm Laura Van Camp. I'm the lead ESL teacher in Rutherford County. And I serve four schools ranging from elementary to high school. So I have a K-12 caseload and I love that. I just finished my 17th year teaching ESL. I've been on the EL support team since 2016. And I'm so excited to be here with all of you, meet you, learn from you, and hopefully you'll learn something today that you can carry with you to your classroom this coming year. Next, I'd like to give you just a little overview of WebEx. Um, if you're not familiar with it, you don't use it on a regular basis, here's a, a screenshot that can familiarize you with our conference platform. So uh, there are some things similar to Zoom, but um, here are a few of the features. In the lower left-hand corner, you can see the meeting details. In the middle, under this lovely lady's face, you can see the um, meeting controls and you can find your name if you want to raise your hand but because we have a smaller group today you can just unmute most of the time but make sure you find the mute button and you'll have the option to unmute during the discussion activities and you want to make sure during the meeting that your microphone is muted just so we don't have any uh, distractions during the meeting i'm sure all of you are very accustomed to that and you can change your video out, layout and view to customize that as you like. And hopefully this will help you feel more comfortable and we want you to actively participate during our session so we can all gain as much as we can in these short two hours. And if you would, please go ahead and put in the chat the, uh, who you are, what your area of expertise is and um, where you're joining us from. Um, I see some of you have already started doing that. And that gives us a feel for where you, where you are and what you teach or what um, how you serve um, English learners. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I'm going to ask Stacy to back up to slide two. I um, wanted to bring out the Twitter hashtag for this conference is NCELD22. If there's some things that really speak to you, you're really excited about some things today. Please tweet that out and um, use that hashtag um, during the conference. We really appreciate that. Also, some of you may be familiar with this, but 
uh, we've changed from calling our learners English learners to multilingual learners. So they're MLs and all of us are getting used to that right now. But that's why the um, you're going to be hearing us speak about MLs. And we want to define that and make sure that everyone understands what we're talking about there. Okay, and now we'll look at the conference notebook. And we have, um, Laura, we uh -huh. have so many people from all over and I'm seeing chemistry teachers, art and music teachers. I'm seeing um, math. I'm seeing dual language, Forsyth County. Welcome. And uh, Wayne County. And Yay. Lot, we're all over the state here. This is awesome. And Dublin County. Yes. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. That's good. I'm glad you brought that out. That is amazing. Yes, I'm looking right through the chat too. And, and I am so excited to have a variety of um, experts with us. And that's the way we do view you. We know that you're experts in your field. And this is just putting another feather in your cap to be able to be an expert with English language development. And we need you uh, to help us out there in the field. Thank you for coming. Now we'd like to bring your attention to the conference notebook. Probably you've been uh, using this already, but we may have someone that this is your first day participating in the conference and that's totally fine. Uh, we have a conference notebook this year that's digital, that's online, and we're so excited about it. You can click on that top link content area teachers and make a, a copy of the notebook. Now, if you already have one, you don't need to do that because you've already got yours started, but let's just say that there's someone that has it. Um, you make a copy of that, and then you're able to save any thoughts, wows, wonders, um, things that you want to remember in that notebook um, under each session that you're able to attend. So we just wanted to make you aware of that. Again, the tiny URL is on the bottom of most of the slides, if not all, um, that you can access this um, presentation. We've also got our Twitter, Twitter, <laughs> Twitter hashtag at the bottom as well. We're also going to be um, providing some QR codes throughout the presentation. If you are um, needing to scan that on an iPad or your phone to keep up with everything. And one more thing about that, uh, we want you to um, think about opening another tab or maybe another device or screen because you're gonna be looking at today's slides and then you might want to have the artifact uh, notebook, the conference notebook open as well. So we can toggle between those two. And um, that'll be really important in um, the presentation a little bit later on. So just something to think about um, as we are setting ourselves up for success today. Now I'd like to see um, if we can take a pulse check. And this is just to see how familiar you are with the new ELD standards framework. So we're gonna do a poll in WebEx. You're gonna see a poll open up in a panel on your screen. And the question is, how familiar are you with the new ELD standards? Our um, range here is from zero to five. Zero being, um, it's completely new to me. To uh, a five, I eat, sleep, and breathe this standards framework. I don't think we have that many fives, but if we do, be proud to put the five down for us. But just go ahead and click next to the number that describes how you're feeling. Uh, today with the standards framework. We'll give you just a, a few seconds to respond. So you'll click next to the number and click on submit. And we'll see the results. And if you can't see the poll, it's okay. Just put the number in the chat and we'll be able to check that, um, the chat and see what numbers we have there as well. Um, Karen and Laura, it looks like we have about seven people who are finishing up um, the poll, and I'll show the results in a minute. Okay. Thank you. 
And thank you to Stacy. Stacy is our ELA World Language Section Chief, and she's here with us facilitating today. And thank you, Stacy. We so appreciate your time and your presence here. Absolutely. We need all of our experts on board. Stacy is proud to say that Title III is part of our section, part of her section, our section. We're going to take uh, part in being proud of Title III. All right. I think I just shared the um, results. Okay, great. So I'm looking at um, our highest percentage is the number two, which is I've looked at it, but I haven't dug into it. That's been... Um, a trend across the last few days and um, then we've got a split between zero and one so that is completely fine we're going to take this piece by piece today and break it down so that when you leave today you're going to feel a lot more comfortable with the unpacking documents wonderful and then we've got 13 percent at a four and we've got five percent at a three and zero at a five, including myself. I don't think I sleep, eat, sleep, and breathe this either. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you so much for participating in this pulse check. And uh, we're going to move on. And Karen will explain to us our objectives today. Great. Thanks, Laura. So, our objectives today are to become, first of all, familiar and acquainted with the purpose, format, contents, and location of the ELD unpacking documents. We also want to uh, provide you with some ideas for how to use the resource in support of implementation of the newly adopted NCELD SOS. And additionally, we're going to have a chance to reflect on practices, check out some research-based standards that are aligned, and finally, create an artifact that's going to promote future application of this material. That's critical um, so that when you walk away from this session and you start school in the fall, that you'll uh, be able to come back to this and be able to say, oh yeah, I remember what this is about. You can access this presentation by again, going to the tiny URL along the bottom of the presentation, or if you're just joining us, you can scan the QR code at the top right corner. The contents, okay, so let's go ahead and get started with uh, our unpacking. We're going to start with our first objective. So the purpose of this document is, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. On March 4th of 2021, the State Board of Education unanimously approved the 2020 edition of the WIDA English Language Development Standards as North Carolina's ELD standard course of study. To successfully implement these standards, NCDPI has created this unpacking documents to deepen the understanding of the standards and show how content and language can be learned together. The purpose of these documents is to increase student achievement by providing access to these rich standards-based grade level contents by ensuring all educators have a clear understanding of the expectation of the document of the adopted standards. So let's look at, let's set the stage. We have five standards with social instructional language, language of language arts, language of math, language of science, and language of social studies that we focus on for English language development. So everything branches off of our content areas. Next, when we look at our language expectations, there are goals for content-driven language learning. So let's unpack the format. We have the ELD stands for English Language Development. The LA here refers to the language of language arts. The grade span in this um, example is 6-8, and the key language use is narrative. Then the mode is interpretive and we'll go into that one more in depth later. There are key language uses that are embedded in our standards. 
across all of those areas. Each of these are critical to development of our students' ability to communicate effectively in English, whether it's science, math, social studies, or ELA. We have narrate, inform, explain, and argue, and these align with those content area standards. I like the way this is that was um, color coordinated to show how you can use the different verbs and the different words for each of those areas. Thank you, Stacy. But today we're going to focus on the resource of unpacking. So in the center of this um, resource hub is the unpacking icon. And you may want to add this link to your conference notebook so that you can come back and refer to it later. And Laura, give them a tour. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we are going to take a tour of the actual format of our unpacking document. Um, it's very important that uh, we see how this is laid out because when you first look at this, it can be just a little bit overwhelming because there's a lot of text there. But um, we're going to take it piece by piece and just see um, how all of this is put together. So at the very top of um, this a screenshot, you're going to see that the ELD standard four, which is the language of science, is um, what this particular standard is going to be talking about. So let me just back up a little bit. In ESL, we have five standards. We have the standard of um, social and instructional language. So we have to teach our students how to be able, and not just we, all of us, have to teach our students how to understand that social interaction between other classmates, between you, when they get on the playground, how to talk to each other in that survival language, or sometimes they call it playground talk, um, how to get to the bathroom, all those things, the basic needs. So social and instructional, how to understand the teacher, right? So all of those things are what all of the multilingual learners are going to be craving to understand in the very beginning when they're newcomers. But they're going to be growing in that very, very quickly. And then um, we have the language of English language arts. So they have to know all that vocabulary, you know, characters and main idea, all of that kind of thing to calibrate their mind to the content area of English language arts. And then they have to learn the language of science in the same way, putting themselves in that, um, you know, type of context where they're learning the science vocabulary. And then the same thing with social studies and the same thing with math. So for ESL teachers, we are very aware that we are teaching them how to be able to succeed in all of the content areas. So for this particular standard that we're looking at, this is the language of science. And then right below that is the language expectation. And this is what would be listed on an ESL teacher's um, lesson plan. So it would, the ELD stands for English language development. The SC stands for science. The K stands for kindergarten. And then, and then of course it would be uh, one for first grade and so on and so forth, up the numbers for grade levels. That's always going to be there. And then inform is one of the language key uses that Kieran went over. So it's either explain, argue, inform, or narrate. So one of those four key uses. And then the next word is either going to be interpretive or expressive. So interpretive means they're taking in the information. Expressive means they are giving out information. And usually interpretive, they're listening and reading. And expressive, they're going to be speaking and writing. All right. So that's just a little crash course in what that standard uh, nomenclature involves. So basically the language expectation is what are we focusing on? 
All right. And then below that, there are two bullets. So there's two different things that this standard includes. And there's a clarification for each bullet. The teal box on the left the, under skills, that first box will clarify the first bullet and the teal box underneath that will clarify the second bullet. Now, if you look to the right, you're going to see in the classroom bordered in gold is a classroom idea. It's it's a sample. So this may be what a teacher would do with this standard is by no means all inclusive or anything like that. It's just an idea of what um, this could look like in the classroom. So it may it's an idea for during the lesson. And then below that in the purple box, you see the sample sample language objective. So that's what objective the ESL teacher would be, you know, showing on the screen or writing on the board, um, putting before the students before this lesson would take place. All right. So and then you can see there's another um, classroom idea and language objective for the second bullet that's clarified there. So we wanted to just, you know, focus in on that, let you know how all of this is organized. And with that, oh, thank you for those arrows. That's beautiful. Thank you, Stacy. All right. And now to um, dig a little bit deeper and to kind of help you um, see this in a different angle, uh, breaking down this format even more, this is one of our strategies called number the skills. And it's simple, but it's it's just powerful because this allows us to take this in bite-sized pieces. All right, so the first thing that we're going to do is once we've got a standard selected, um, we're going to um, read the language expectation. And I'm going to, for this one, I'm just going to read this aloud. And this is ELD science. This is second and third grade. And the key use and mode of communication is to explain and it's expressive. All right. So we know that we're going to be asking students to explain something and to express. So that means we're going to ask them to tell us what they know based on what teaching we're doing. All right, so it's usually in the form of speaking and writing. All right, the first skill, thank you. The first skill that we're going to ask the students to do is called construct scientific explanations. We're going to ask the students to explain something in a way about a scientific topic. The next skill we're going to look at is describe observations. So this is the second piece of this where they're going to observe something and describe it for us. All right. The third skill we're going to ask the students to do is to describe data about something. OK, a phenomenon in science. So maybe this is um, photosynthesis. Maybe this is um, a life cycle. Maybe this is chemical changes, pH any of those amazing things that we explore in science about a phenomenon. All right. So there's three things that we're doing. So right now, what we've just done is we have highlighted and we have numbered. Other things that you could do is list, uh, underline, circle. Um, all of those are very effective. Writing on his little sticky note. Um, all of those things is um, taking this apart and helping us as a teacher realize what it is that we need to be teaching. Okay, so the next part of this is, oh, and I just want to go back to what I just said. You want to know what skills and how many skills. So in this case, we know that we're going to do those particular skills and we know there's three of them. Now we need to think, put our put our thinking hat on here. How are we going to ask teachers, uh, excuse me, how are we going to measure 
students understanding for what we've identified. So how are we going to know that these students have done this? In this particular example, if we look at um, the sample language objective, uh, students will be able to describe data from observations about a phenomenon by charting pitch and volume of vocal sounds. All right, that's the first data um, observations. That's the observations piece. They're also going to be describing and drawing a label diagram of the ear. All right, that's the other piece. And then they're going to be as well as explaining to their partners how the sound moves from the ear through the ear and is understood by the brain. So that is the constructing scientific explanations. So maybe in the language objective, they're not necessarily in order like they are up there, one, two, and three, but they are present. So the objective encapsulates all of the skills that we want to teach them. Now I'm going to read the in the classroom idea. So this is what the kids are actually going to be doing. Students explore sound. So this has got to be in the second and third grade science uh, standards. So we know sound is going to be explored there. Students explore sound with a partner by taking turns and charting whether a vocal sound is high or low, which is pitch, and loud or soft, which is volume. Students then use sound vocabulary to explain to the partner that sound waves are collected by the outer ear, vibrate in the eardrum, and cause the tiny bones in the middle ear to vibrate, and then move through the bones in the inner ear where sounds are understood by the brain. Students may draw a label diagram of the ear as well. So here we have the nuts and bolts and those amazing pieces of what this teacher has planned in this lesson. So you say you see that they have beautifully um, you know, illustrated what it is that a teacher could do with this particular um, standard by numbering these skills. All right, and with that, um, I'm going to ask you to take a turn at doing the same thing. We're um, going to look at a different standard. And what I want you to do is just the first part right now. I want you to take a moment to read the standard, the skills, the classroom scenario, and objective to yourself. And I'll give you a little bit of time to do that. Okay, so hopefully I gave you enough time to look that over. And so we're looking at a first grade unpacking for social studies. So this is the language of social studies. This is the, the we're tying together, and this is really what ESL is. We're tying together English language development plus content. And those two ideas are intertwined with everything that we do. And so right now we're kind of using a magnifying glass to look at some language and content area standards for social studies, along with the English language development. And now um, the second part of this 
what I want you to do is highlight what skills and how many skills should be taught. And I want to tell you, this is not a mystery. This is right there. If you look at that language expectation, I want you to think about what skills and how many skills should be taught. And go ahead and drop that in the chat when you've, when you've discovered that. Um, go ahead and drop that in the chat for us. Oh, that's amazing, Emily. So she's saying pitch and volume that's covered in elementary music. Wow. I'm sure everyone's going to be having some interesting connections with uh, the standards here. So thank you for sharing that. Amy's got a question. Why would this not be expressive if the students writing and working in small groups? Thank you for asking that. Um, the reason why this would be an interpretive standard is because we're asking them to um, take some things in. In this particular standard, they're going to be looking at um, a picture. So they're going to be taking in a visual. And then they're going to be looking at um, things that they see about different topics. They're going to be sharing out, which is expressive. Interpretive and expressive do go together. But ultimately, what we're going to be asking the students to do is identify and um, take what we're teaching them, taking it in. There is an expressive part to this that comes um, later on in the standards. So um, in essence, we're going to be asking students to take in information and then be able to give it out. So thank you for pointing that out. And they do work together very closely, and you're going to be able to see that. And Stacy's just saying, make, um, remember that these interpretive and expressive things can't be learned in isolation, just like reading and writing. These modes of communications are connected and reinforce each other. Absolutely. So thank you for bringing that out. All right. And I've, I see here that uh, interpret and identify. You're exactly right. Um, the skills that we're numbering here is interpret social studies arguments and identifying the topic. Good job, everybody. All right. Number three, I want you to think about how you would determine mastery or measure student understanding for the skills that we've identified in this. All right, drop these in the chat or unmute if you'd like um, to tell us how, um, how in this particular sample, um, this teacher is measuring the student understanding or determining ma uh, mastery. Those are synonymous, by the way. All right, Sandra's saying define as they listen to activity, exactly. So as you're recording, you're looking for depth of responses. Yes, we the formative assessment has to happen. So we're te as teachers, we're listening as they're doing this. Thank you for pointing that out. Accuracy and details. Thank you, Dana. That's exactly right. Defining their terms. There's all kinds of ways that we could be measuring student uh, progress and um, understanding. Just keep those coming as they come to you. I know you're typing in and sometimes speaking is kind of like faster than typing. And um, as you can see underlined in red on the screen, the teacher records the student's responses after the discussion. Wonderful. The teacher scribes on art paper. Mm -hmm. So maybe underlining um, in that sample uh, scenario is going to be very powerful for us. Also, you can see um, in the objective, I want to make sure I'm looking at the chat here, they're getting evidence from the text and discussion. Yes, as a teacher, you're listening to the depth of those small group conversations. You're writing nouns from the text. Absolutely. 
Uh, we've got an interactive support with the small groups in the objective. We've got um, identifying the topic. That's huge. Um, there's all kinds of pieces built into this where the students are interacting and the teacher is recording. And yes, we've got a collaboration. Um, John, thank you. Uh, between the teacher and the students, it's not just this, the teacher um, giving instruct, uh, direct instruction right here. We've got that interaction and collaboration between the teacher and students. And um, they're going to be generating a possible title for um, the argument for identifying the topic. Great job, everyone. You are really um, honing in on what we're talking about here. So please um, take put this in your toolbox. I know that you're already doing this with your content. Um, and maybe if you've got an, an ES, uh, multilingual learner, in your classroom this year, you can go to this unpacking for ELD and say, oh, now I'm getting some ideas here. Um, this is not just do this, do that. We've actually got something to work with here in these classroom scenarios, as someone was pointing out earlier in the chat. Um, and this does include inquiry based learning. That's exactly right. All right, and now I'm going to ask uh, you to draw your attention to another strategy. Please go ahead and keep um, putting your wows and wonders in the chat with a uh, number of the skills because that's just what we need to learn. We can learn from the chat from listening to other people's ideas. All right. And now I want to draw your attention to another strategy called the best fit. And um, we're going to look at another standard. This one happens to be a social studies standard for grades four through five. I'm going to read through this aloud. And all you have to do right now is to kind of close your eyes and listen. I want you to think about what you notice and what you wonder. Okay. Just those two things. And when you, uh, as I am reading this aloud, once I um, read through everything, I'm going to ask you to drop these in the chat, your, what you notice and what you wonder. All right, so the language expectation is um, social studies four or five. They're going to be explaining, that's our key use. And the mode of expression is interpretive. Interpret social studies explanations by determining different opinions in sources for answering compelling and supporting questions about phenomena or events. So that is chock full of different things. All right, so this skill, the clarification of it is students identify various opinions expressed in a variety of sources for answering compelling and supporting questions about phenomena or events. So the language functions here are, we're gonna define these terms, opinions, what are opinions? What is a compelling question? What is a supporting question? And what is phenomena? And they're gonna be determining what are different opinions in sources for answering these questions and what are de um, determining different opinions in these supporting questions about a phenomena or event. All right, so now that we've got that calibrated, we're gonna think about this classroom scenario. Students listen to a read aloud of three different sources regarding the, the decline of the furniture industry in North Carolina. All right, so most people are familiar with that. All right, so the sources are number one, a newspaper article on furniture plant closings. Number two, a letter to the editor from, from an unemployed furniture worker. So that's definitely gonna give us another perspective and opinion. Number three, an online interview with a legislator serving the area with closed down furniture plants. Okay, so three very different opinions and perspectives. 
Students listen in order to answer the compelling question. Here it is. What factors led to the decline of the furniture industry in North Carolina? The teacher guides the class in identifying the opinion in the newspaper article. Using the document camera and highlighting while thinking aloud. Students form small groups and identify opinions in either the letter to the editor or the online interview, highlighting sentences that support opinions and referring to the anchor chart as needed. So this is really fun. This is a great topic. This is um, great sources. This is um, a great compelling question. All right, so right now, tell me what you noticed. Tell me what you wondered in the chat or um, feel free to unmute and tell us what you noticed and what you wondered. And in the chat, I love um, what everyone is sharing right here. Amy's saying compare and contrast difference between opinion and fact. We had that come out yesterday in, in our discussion. That's great. Um, a, mo a teacher modeling a strategy. Thank you, John. Yes. I wonder how many of our students will be able to connect with this because someone in their family knows how to make their own furniture and they'd be able to express that. Awesome. That's connecting to their own lives. And that's something that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later with another strategy. Yay. Um, they like how um, many of the classroom sections uh, include group work. So that's a wow. Uh, primary and secondary sources can be a, a connection. Yes, that is a notice. Opinion versus fact, cause and effect, displaying and highlighting, not just verbalizing. That's right. So a lot of our multilingual learners are trying to take in information. It's um, and they need that oral piece. They've got to talk about it first before they can actually put it down on paper or speak it out. Thank you. Uh, it's talking about how you must look at all sources in media before formulating an opinion of your own. Yay. Asking students to circle opinion um, or different point of view words for each source. Yes, Stephanie. Um, do the groups share results? That's a good wonder. Yes, of course. Um, lots of amazing notices and wonders. I could just go on forever, but in the interest of time, I'm going to go on to the next piece of this. All right, so we're going to go to part. This is our part two of strategy two. You're going to see on the screen, look deeply now at the in the classroom idea. So just focus on that for me. Let's look at this again. Again, we're swimming in this right now. So remember that we're talking about the decline of the furniture industry. We've got three different sources, that newspaper article, that letter, that online interview, the compelling question, what led to the decline. We've got that in our head right now. Tell me. Where does this piece fit? Does it fit in the introduction to this in a lesson? Does it fit in the direct instruction or modeling piece? Does it fit in guided practice or in independent practice or closure? So tell me where you would use this. Let's say that you're going to use this idea in your classroom. Where would this fit into a lesson plan? Drop that in the chat or unmute to let us know. Great, Danielle saying independent or groups. All right, good. There's no one answer to this, by the way. All right, D it depends. Okay, that's what I say a lot. It depends on the lesson flow from beginning, middle and end, thank you. Okay, yes, it can be instruction and modeling. Absolutely. It can be in small groups once the 
the whole group has has learned this. You could reinforce this in small groups. Yes, and that is exactly right. Got it for some students. It could be um, whole group or it could be for the whole, uh, small groups independent. All of you are exactly right. It depends on what you're what you're trying to accomplish here. So if I've got um, students of different proficiency levels in my group, uh, maybe in your classroom, you've got students that need more reinforcement. This can definitely be um, a way of differentiating in your classroom for um, your EC students, for your EL students, I'm excusing, ML students, for your, uh, maybe you could even ratchet it up some for your AIG, right? So there's a lot of wonderful things that you could do. Thank you for sharing that. Now, what I want you to do, number three, what instruction might need to happen before or after it? Okay, so think about that. What instruction could happen before this takes place or after it? Drop that in the chat for us. Okay background knowledge definitely so, yeah in fourth and fifth grade some of them may not be um as familiar with the with the decline of the furniture industry it happens to be that in rutherford county we've got a Broyhill plant that closed down Broyhill, and that's a big name in the furniture industry and Pretty much all of our students know about Broyhill. We've also got uh, Cone Mills. We've got Stonecutter. Uh, a lot of our um, uh, different industry mills, maybe not furniture, but textiles, um, that the students could identify with right here in our Rutherford County. And I'm sure you could give examples where you live um, of the same thing. So yes, um, deep, uh, delving deeper into state history, giving that essential vocabulary, um, what constitutes a credible source, absolutely. Um, it's not just off Wikipedia. It, <laughs> we're gonna be looking at those primary and secondary sources. Thank you for bringing that out. Um, it's good to have the teacher demonstrate what is expected from one of the sources and break that into the groups, break that down into groups um, for the two sources and then come together. So you can definitely do a jigsaw with this. Um, connecting to the struggles of unemployment, which is definitely a concern right now. The background on regional industries. Um, it, you could be highlighting um, after instruction, which furniture industry companies have shut down and why. Yes, fantastic. You guys are really um, doing a great job on this. The effect on economy and employment. Yes. So this could be even a middle school and high school uh, connection. Now what I want you to do, I'm gonna ask you to do uh, the same thing that we did uh, in strategy two, the best fit. I want you to look at a different standard and do the same thing in for uh, best fit in this classroom idea. So this particular standard on your screen is for uh, social and instructional language for grades four through 12. And this is about argue. So we want uh, students to be able to debate or argue about different perspectives. All right, so I'm gonna give you a moment to um, Think about this, how could students generate questions about gener uh, different perspectives? All right, so look at this standard on your screen. So students are gonna be clarifying, the clarification of this standard is students will be identifying various opinions expressed in a variety of sources for answering compelling and supporting questions about phenomena or events. Look deeply at the in the classroom idea. So students brainstorm a class list of different perspectives on a particular topic. 
After brainstorming, students choose two of these perspectives to explore, developing questions about them. Students develop questions like, I understand the perspective of blank. Have we considered blank? Or how is blank different from blank? Or what would it look like if blank? Or how did blank decide? blank so these are things that these are um uh question frames that we would use these are supports or scaffolds that we use with our um multilingual learners but certainly can be used for all for all learners um tell me where does this in the classroom fit in introduction direct instruction modeling guided practice, independent practice, or closure. Where does that fit? Drop that in the chat for us or unmute. We'd love to hear some of your voices. Okay, so Shannon's saying guided practice and independent practice, absolutely. It just depends. It just depends where, what your point, what your uh, purpose is. Link and hook is brainstorming. Thank you very much. Yes. Laura, we also had a question mm -hmm. in the chat about what, what uh, standard was the SI. SI is social instructional language. And that also includes not only the informal conversational language, but the language in the classroom that is when when teachers are giving directions. So whether you've got to explain something, argue something, um, one common way to look at this is when you go to your your EOGs or your EOCs, the language that are in those test questions, one common one that can throw students is when you have to state something and they think, well, the, we, I live in the state of North Carolina. So it's using that language or as in these sentence frames are very much, very high level academic um, ways to phrase questions that we want all of our learners to use, but it's more explicitly taught in the ML classroom where we're taking students to this higher level of um navigating language in, in instructional and academic platforms so si is our social instructional there's a little slash so it's both that encompasses all of that but primarily um also for directions okay i hope that helps clarify thank you karen that's that's excellent um as we are trying to to teach um our students you know, it's almost like we have to simplify and clarify and provide those scaffolds so that um, the ML student can express what they know, because many times they understand what's going on, but actually being able to let you know what's going on in their head is a little bit more of a challenge for them. So when you provide, take some of the pressure off by providing some of these scaffolds, it really does help them so very much. And um, now I wanna ask you, what instruction might need to happen before this or after it? Very similar to last time, building that background knowledge, painting that canvas for them. Let me give an example of this. Uh, I had some, children that were newcomers and they were in a third grade classroom talking about the underground railroad now these children were from a large city in south america they were used to um the subway they were used to uh, trains they were used to this type of um, transportation and so they thought they were talking about a subway system Right, so we had to intentionally go in and paint that background and explain to them that the Underground Railroad had to do with uh, the United States uh, in our history when people were trying to help the slaves come, go to freedom in the North. 
So that was just mind blowing for them. Um, and so, you know, explaining all of that before you get into the topic, especially in social studies, um, is extremely important. Um, also, I'm seeing in the chat, people are saying that um, you have to explain before you get into this, explain um, that background knowledge modeling for the students, um, ask, giving them vocabulary, reading through the examples, discussing different perspectives. And, you know, if you look at your um, back at the standard, you're asking them to argue. All right. What does an argument look like? What does a debate look like? How do you do pros and cons? And so there may be need to be a good bit of instruction unless you've done something kind of similar to this before. And then there may need to be some deep briefing um, and making those connections to something that they already know about. That's right, Michael. And um, so, you know, this is could be just a piece of the the grand scheme of things yeah, as we think about this. Also, those um, respectful debate rules or norms. These are our norms for debating and arguing back and forth and using those um, uh, different cultures and what you could expect um, to happen in different cultures. Excellent, weaving that in as well. Wow, I could do this all day. This is so fun. But in an interest of time, <laughs> I'm going to hand it back over to Karen to uh, talk to us a little more about the modes of communication. Awesome. Yes, that is some great discussion. And I love that we're really looking at the details here of unpacking and being able to look at these and, and take the, this time to do this. So about modes of communication, I promised we'd go in more in depth in this. We have the two primary modes of communication, which is interpretive and expressive. And you can see in this language object or this science objective here, excuse me, um, some kindergarten examples. So we've got um, interpretive, which is our receptive modes, which is includes listening, reading and viewing. Um, and then we've got expressive mode, which is a productive mode of speaking, writing, and representing, whether it's a presentation or creating something, constructing something. In the examples here, we've got um, all different scientific information and scientific explanations. And when you look at those verbs that go along with that, in the interpretive, we've got determining, defining, and then expressive, introducing, providing. We've got, again, interpretive with defining the investigable questions or using information. And then with the explain, the expressive, we've got describing information, relating how, and comparing. So let's go to the next slide, please. And now let's consider. Um, we've put them side by side so you can compare and contrast. So looking at these two kinds of objectives, I want you to notice what kind of verbs are used in the interpretive objectives. Will you put those in the chat box, please? On the left side, the interpretive. What are the verbs? Yes, we've got very good identifying main ideas analyzing points of view about the same event or topic and evaluating how details, reasons, and evidence support particular points in the text. And now let's look, what are the kinds of verbs that are used in the expressive objectives? All right, thank you. Yes, we've got introduce and develop. We've got support opinions with reasons and information. We've got use a formal style. And then we've got logically connect opinions to appropriate evidence and facts. Good job. Thank you for putting that in the chat. And 
how are they similar and how are they different? I want to remind you that it's tricky because there are many and to look out for after the semicolons. Right there in the blue, well, it's now red. Um, so you've got more than one there. Again, right there where you see end data offer a concluding statement or section. Yes, Sarah, seeing versus doing, right? I like that, Shannon, Ex expressive verbs support the interpretive verbs, yes. They work, it's, it's kind of like reading and writing. Uh, better readers make better writers and better writers make better readers. It just, it's a cycle. So you've got that interpretive taking it in and then doing something with it. If you just take it in, take it in, take it in and you never express it or talk about it, you're not fully wiring your brain to be able to fully um, be able to have that depth of knowledge that we want our learners to have. Excellent. So there we have them highlighted for you. And so how are they similar and how are they different? How are they similar? And feel free to unmute. We have a small group today. Okay, so we have interpretive verbs, somehow the input and the expressive is the output. They both tell a story. Thanks, John, I love that because you're getting that whole cycle of your content when they're working together. Yes, all right, so let's move on to the next slide. And they do, they complement each other. Now, again, this is strategy three, it's interpretive and expressive. So you will be coming back to these strategies as part of your artifact, I meant to remind you of that. Um, so let's look at a math language expectation here for grades six to eight. What kinds of verbs are used in the interpretive objectives? Take a moment and note those. One of the things I love about working with um, these objectives is it does cross all content areas. We all work together and integration is a strong way to be able to uh, get this content out for us. Okay, so yes, we have identifying, analyzing, and evaluating. And then let's look and see what are the expressive objectives here in this math example. What do you want your students to be able to produce or represent so that they can show you that they have learned these content concepts? Um, exactly. So I see some some things that they're going to be able to talk about. They're going to be able to write about because they're going to be introducing. They're going to be sharing, describing, and stating um, reasoning used to generate solution. Excellent. Excellent. All right. And then how are they similar again and how are they different? Go ahead and drop it in the chat or if you want to unmute. Okay, they both give reasons. One is creating, Emily said, and the other is assessing what exists. Oh, I like that. Um, both require processing time. Yes, yes, Liz, thank you for saying that. So, and with the appropriate supports or scaffolds for our multi-learners, they can all be, um, actively involved in this cycle of learning. Um, very important, very important to have that processing time. One, both interpret info, one is taking in and processing it, the other is, is putting it out, but it also takes time to be able to do that. Um, very important as they're wiring, uh, firing and wiring, as Janet Zadina says, um, new information 
it needs to be over and over again. It's not going to be um, anything that happens just one time. It's got to be repetitive so that they can actually have that strong um, pathway in the brain. And uh, M Michelle said, expressive is proving what you learned in the interpretive. Excellent. And you need interpretive to do expressive in math and in all subjects, right? Yes. Thank you. Yes, those pathways. So uh, how we learn, it's so important. All right, very good. Let's move on to unpacking our artifact. So we've got to create an artifact that will promote future application of this material. So in the next slide, what I would like you to see is the different grade spans. You're going to be able to choose the grade span that you teach or you want to look at closer. I know uh, someone said they're from art, some of the, the very um, various areas of expertise. Think about a grade level you would like to focus on for your artifact. And what you're going to be able to do is look at the language expectations for that grade level. So if you choose, for instance, um, grade six, eight, you're going to look at the document that shows you the unpacking for the social instructional, the ELA, the math, the science, and the social study standards. And then you're going to, in within that framework, you're going to choose a language expectation. You can choose um, whichever one and look at the interpretive and the expressive as we've done here. So if I um, uh, go to that breakout room, we're asking generally five to six, but since we have a smaller group today, if, if you want to do four or five in a group, that might be uh, productive. But then you're going to um, go to a document that will allow you to unpack those standards for that grade level. Um, you can choose uh, the first strategy that Laura talked about, the number of the skills where you break apart each of those um, that part of the objective or the second strategy was the best fit where you're looking at the classroom scenario and focusing on that and where does it fit in the lesson or you can do strategy three where you're really honing in on that interpretive and expressive objectives and you're comparing and contrasting them to see how they would fit in a lesson and how you would unpack them in your classroom we also talked about early on toggling back and forth between different windows. If you would like to go ahead and once you get to the document with your group in your breakout room um, and fill that in, then you can share that link, paste it over on your notebook that you've um, generated with the conference so that you have this artifact as part of your learning, whether you turn it in for CEUs to your district at the end, or whether you just want to come back to this in the fall and say, I remember that session or those sessions, and you want to see specifically what you had worked on and what you had unpacked, um, then you'll have that link to easily come back to this document um, and be able to refer to it in the fall or later as you um, are able to. So again, just as a as a note, um, you're going to think about the grade cluster um, that you want to go to. Then you want are going to um, Stacy's going to open up some breakout rooms, and we're going to share a slide that to show you what that looks like. And then you're going to on the slide add your names to the page that you want to. I do. There are other examples from other sessions, and and you're free to look at those to get ideas. And then with your group, you're going to choose one of the strategies for unpacking that we shared and unpack your language expectation. Um, you're going to add the link to your notebook or if you want to uh, be jotting down some notes that you want to remember in your notebook. The um, language expectations or the, the um, unpacking documents are also in your notebook. Um, right there with the um, links for them. So you can even look at other grade 
levels after you complete your artifact if you wanted to see how the language expectations change across and align with different um, grade levels. So before we go to um, our breakout groups, we want to give you an idea of what that's going to look like on your screen. So up at the top where it has participants on the right, you'll see breakout sections and they are going to be labeled with those grade level spans so that you will be in a room with like minded individuals who want to see those grade spans. Now, when you go to the document for your artifact to look at these, you may have 10 people in that breakout room. So if you would like to just uh, rejoin the session and go to another room that doesn't have so many people in that same grade span, you'll have, there are multiple rooms and you can see out beside it that there may be zero people in a room and you can just choose another room so that we'll have more discussion going on because I think it's so powerful when you are able to be in a small group, like we've talked about, you've been taking a lot in now, you've been doing a lot of interpreting, but you've also done some expressive by putting in the chat. Nobody's been brave enough yet to unmute, but that's okay. Um, so this is an opportunity for you to continue building your depth of knowledge with these standards, and we want you to have some conversations with this. Um, we're going to also give you about 15 minutes. Um, for that and um, so that you'll have plenty of time if you need to take a quick uh, restroom break or take care of something, you can do that too. But, um, and yes, we also want you to be um, sharing out um, if you want to uh, tweet something out or if you want to um, share it on Go Open. We have all of those links here within the, the presentation as well. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute about this process, or if you want to put it safely in the chat, that's fine as well um, before we open up the breakout rooms. Breakout rooms are actually now open, and I think some people are already joining rooms, which is great. So just make sure to follow the directions that you see on that slide to join the grade band that you'd like to work with. And then all you have to do is just follow the directions in the slide deck for your grade band. Um, if you um, can't navigate WebEx and you can't seem to find your breakout session, um, just let us know what grade level you'd like to work with in the chat and we can help move you over. Awesome. And again, if you see up at the top right, you have um, under participants, it has breakout sessions. And then when you click on the breakout sections, it should it should show you um, grade and the grade span. And then it'll have group A, B, C, D. And then in the parentheses, it has a number and that's the number of people that are already within that group. So um, that you can see which group to join. If you're still in the main room, it looks like there's about 13 of you. Um, please let us know in the chat which grade band you'd like to work with and we'll move you over. If not, we may just move you to a random room um, so that you can work with um, other colleagues. Stacy, I have some that are saying that they're on a phone. Is it possible for them to be able to do this on a phone? Do you know? They should be able to. Um, once we move them over and they accept the invitation, they still should be able to. It's just, I don't know if they're um, accessing the screen or not. Like, I don't know if they have viewing rights. Unless okay. they downloaded the app. Okay.
So Courtney, Maxine, Michael, Tanya, if you just let me know in the chat what um, breakout rooms you'd like to be in, I can move you over. It's interesting again today, grades two and seven are a strong hit, and so are awesome grades six, eight. Oh, and we have several in high school.
Does it look like they're going to need more than five minutes based on what you see in the slide decks or do you think they're okay to come back in five? I'm looking at the, the high school one now. There we go. I'm looking at first grade. I see that a number of people are working still. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and give a five minute warning and then after five minutes, if they need more time, we can give them more time. I think that's a great idea. Sounds good. Yeah, they're, they're still, I think they, maybe they took a break and then they're just getting into it. We'll see. Seeing some good underlining. I love the highlight. Highlighting. Yes. I love it. Yep. And that's, you know, I think that's just making it meaningful. Mm-hmm. Oh, and four or five, there's lots of highlighting. So if you're on a phone and you're listening, um, I'd like to encourage you to be able to um, check out these unpacking um, standard documents for the artifacts and um, see what you can add. Everybody's in a breakout room, so they can't hear you. Really? Everybody is? So we have 100%? Uh-huh. Oh, that's fantastic. See, because it shows participants 39 at the top, but I don't have a way to see. I guess I could just go through the breakout sessions and be able to count them all up and see where they all are. They're actually adding notices, wonders, uh, what needs to happen before and after like they're applying all the strategies that's because you did such a so, good job explaining all of that it was awesome you rocked it oh, thank you you, just, you you really oh it was it was beautiful you did a great job thank with you. that you really did you gave them thought time as you were in the processing time um as you were going through to really let them take it in Good job. That's that's how I would have to do it myself. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you for saying that. And it's it's so much to take in. You have to break it down. <laughs> but there's so much excitement with this group. They're so right now going, oh my gosh, this is a mm -hmm. fabulous document. And I just I feel they're appreciation and they're just they're, they love the classroom scenarios um so i think that's that's just really really great yeah i think giving them ideas for how they could apply this to instruction is probably one of the best highlights of the unpacking document and how their their esl teacher or ml teacher is a resource for them Mm -hmm. you know and that we are supporting them with what we do in our our lessons in our classes that our standards come from these standards that they're also teaching and now good conversation can come between the two and um as we increase language for their emails i just had an idea you know maybe there's someone i know we've got a music arts teacher here Mm -hmm. There could be PE teachers. There, there is. could be there PE. could be people that that do those special areas that they don't really know what 
the ESL teacher is doing. Mm-hmm. And, exactly. You know, the social and instructional language is their their piece of this where let's say that we've got newcomers maybe the PE teacher would give the ESL teacher some vocabulary for them to know before they get to PE Mm -hmm. you know what what is uh well we have positional words they're gonna do yeah but positional words I mean that's and that's positional words yeah you're gonna throw the ball over your head or you know but there's so much modeling that goes on in PE I love that you know they they actually show them and they have the kids do it um and it's so physical so you got that TPR going on as well you know I'm going to go ahead and um, like close out the breakout rooms and then it should give them like a one minute uh, timer and bring everybody back. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's 1030. I love the breakout room slide, by the way. Yes. Love it. Can we do this next week too? <laughs> <laughs> I am tired, so you're going to have to do it without me. <laughs> it just wouldn't be the same. <laughs> I'm like, did I just say that? <laughs> I don't know who just said that. <laughs> Y'all need to come to my house and help me with this glad prep. <laughs> I got something for everybody to do. <laughs> we got to get together. If you can operate a pair of scissors, I need you. So and a glue stick. That's still in my skill set. All right. Is it going to be face to face? Yes. Awesome. And it's going to be a small group. I think we're going to have around 12 students and maybe eight teachers, which is a lot smaller, but we have a grant. So it's okay. Nice. Everyone is coming back in the room. Yay. Welcome back. Hey, I hope welcome. all of you. Um, enjoyed your time to collaborate and share your wows, wonders, notices, and ideas together. Um, Karen and I were talking about our wows and wonders too. When you've got content area teachers like yourselves, you know, I was thinking to myself as an ESL teacher, I need to be talking to my PE teacher, my art teacher, all my specials teacher, exploratory teachers, and saying, hey, what are those vocabulary words that you need me to start introducing? What are those ideas, those big ideas that mm-hmm. I need to be talking about in my social and instructional um, piece of what I do? And I think that, you know, this would be a great way for us to collaborate. And um, I'm seeing in the chat, people are Commenting, commenting about the amazing folks in their groups. That's great. And right now, what I would like for you to do is to unmute or share in the chat. What did you learn about the language expectations? What wows and wonders popped up for you? Um, is there a representative from kindergarten or first grade that would like to share? Maybe unmute and share with us. We'd like to hear your voices. And then I'll ask for the other grade levels after that. Kindergarten or first grade, do we have a brave soul? Or also share in the chat. Um, hi, my name's Rebecca, and I did first grade with Sandra. Um, <clears throat> we didn't get super far because we both decided we were not really tech savvy. So it took us a long time to figure out um, where to find all our documents. But we did talk about. Um, using journals to identify characters and connecting the beginning, middle, and end, and um, using highlighters. And in the past, for um, characters, to do character um, characteristics, I have always had them draw a picture and then slice it down the center. And first, they tell me the things that they see about the character on the outside, but then, then it makes it easier for them to talk about the things that you can't see that we've learned about them from the story. And then they write that on the inside. Love oh, wow. That. <laughs> That's awesome. That's fantastic. That's great. Woo. <laughs> That's fantastic. And we, in the yourself. Go, 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 Rebecca. You did wonderful. Woo, woo. <laughs> 
thank you for that. <laughs> we all need encouragement and that that praise and our thank you for that. <laughs> And our students need that too. Every little step that they make is a big deal. And um, all right, so do we have someone from second or third grade that would like to share next? Um, we have some issues finding the documents and when we came out of the room it I lost it I don't know where it is so we were trying to figure out if you wanted us to develop a new one or use what was already there we were trying to do one for math well <laughs> basically what you know we wanted you to do is to use one of those strategies to unpack one of the standards that you chose yes but you know chose, are you expressive but I don't know where the document went that we were That's working crazy. on. When we oh, I know all of this technology sometimes takes practice to get all that under control. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing. So you were wanting to do a math standard and your grade level second and third. Yes, second and third. OK, and what what kind of prompted you to go to the math standard? Because sometimes that's the hardest one for um, teachers to understand about that the language is very important. Like for me, when the ESL teacher, I taught ESL last year and I'm going back to the classroom this year and it opened my eyes to see, wow, we as a classroom teacher sometimes don't, don't assume the students understand the language. And I realize they don't if I'm not very yeah. explicit in my teaching. And math was was one of the ones that the kids struggled the most when I was teaching in ESL. Or okay, I have also encountered that as an ESL teacher. And um, I think, you know, the language part of math is very important, especially when we get to the EOG. It, yeah, and they see those vocabulary words and those multiple meaning words and maybe words that are just not in everyday conversation. Yeah, the, the math has a, even though math is an exact science, the vocabulary can be so broad that sometimes it's hard for the kids to realize what we're asking them to do. And and mine has struggled really bad last year with that. And is it is it Dorali? Dorali? Yes. I love what you you just said and how also we need to think about not just with our multilinguals, but for the past couple of years with instruction across the state and even the nation and around the world, how um, not having all the access to daily classroom instruction has impacted all of our learners. And they've not been sitting around the table at home having these deep academic math conversations or other conversations with that academic language, right? So mm -hmm. it's really important to be able to look at the alignment for that grade or two below where they're even supposed to be right now and say, okay, where is, is their overall instruction going to have been a little bit thin possibly? And what do I really need to make sure that we can uh, discuss and, and, and really get that interpretive uh, language concepts and things going? Um, very important. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. And I see in the chat where someone has said, thank you for bringing that out. Sometimes we need to step. Step outside and look in and see the perspective of. Um, you know, our multilingual learners, our students, other colleagues and see, you know, identify. Those areas um, that need to be improved. Thank you. Thank All right, you. anyone from grade 4 and 5 that would like to share. We love to hear your voices.
Well, while we're waiting, um, I do see Shannon said that she learned that we come from different roles and have commonalities with math problem solving. And we're able to learn a lot from um, her in incredible, amazing group. And I mean, um, that that's w w the power of collaboration. And just seeing in these documents, the language of math that really um, our students need to learn and those big ideas. I think um, even as an ESL teacher myself, I need to make sure that I'm, you know, getting the language from all of these content areas, including our specials areas. And it's just broadening my perspectives as well. Um, anyone from four or five? Uh, yeah, yes, Laura. Yes. Hi, something that was a, uh, I think was a, uh, a, a wow to us or something that jogged our memories was at the, towards the end when we were looking at what we should do before. And the idea came up, well, what about a pre-quiz? And it was just something that we just don't always think about that we got to do that pre-quiz to see where the students are at so we're not boring them and making you no know, behaviors if they already know it so we could work at their levels absolutely that is fantastic um another thing too that we came up with in our group is do these students really know the proper language and have the ability to defend their answer and explain it and back it up so teaching them um what that looks like um, maybe doing a few examples and non examples and having them, you know, debate which student properly explained it, which student truly understood it or had, you know, not that they back it up correctly, but that they had the ability to back it up and did defend their answer. You know what this reminds me of there is an um, I'll try to find this and email this to you guys. There is a clip from a little. Um, movie that talks about the viewpoint, you know what it is, Karen, the viewpoint of a, a newcomer. It's a boy in a classroom and the teacher is teaching math and she's talking about blocks and she's talking about um, a city block in Spanish is calle and and in Spanish block is blocas. So he's getting confused. He knows he's the only kid in that room that knows the answer. He wrote the right answer down, but he could not express it in English. And the teacher just didn't know how to connect with him. And it's amazing, you know, the disconnect there where if he had a sentence frame that said, because of this, this, and this, I got this answer. Or if he had uh, a strategy or a scaffold or if he already was taught that language before the lesson, he would have been a lot more successful in expressing that to the class. And um, I'll, I'll have to for it. Do you know what I'm talking about, Karen? Yes, I haven't seen it in a while, but yes. Okay. And I love sentence frames, especially for our newcomers. Um, there's something that, you know, they, um, uh, I'm trying not to jump ahead of myself when they can actually express language with that support. So when everybody is saying that important key word and then they can use it in a sentence and then everybody says the sentence out loud. Um, and like you were pointing out with that debating and having that, being able to say those sentence frames there, you build muscle memory in your mouth as well as that brain memory in your, your neural pathways. And so it's really great for all learners, but then when everybody's doing that together to build those new academic pathways, your newcomers are able to also be able to build those language expressive modalities as well. Um, so yes, whoever pointed out those sentence frames give academic, um, even debating um, uh, those firing and wiring pathways in the brain. Great. Great conversation. Thank you, Karen. And what are we up to now? Grades six through eight? Where's our middle school representatives? 
I did see one in the chat. They said, breakout wonders, should this be more compli complicated? Wow. No, it's just this simple. <laughs> I love that list. Thank you. <laughs> I like how John said uh, um, he uses Kahoot for pre-quizzes. Mm -hmm. And it reports um, individual performance. It's a fun way to do an assessment. Um, I remember doing a um, PSYOP training where I used Kahoot for the very same purpose. You're absolutely right. Um, <laughs> um, for, 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 for me, what I, what I took away was um, just relating to my own classroom when doing science. And they were, we were talking about earth, earth science. And um, I was saying to myself that, geez, I didn't even realize that sometimes I am there teaching the topic itself, trying for everyone to get the topic. But when it comes on to my ML students, sometimes it's uh, using vocabulary words uh, that they can understand and relate to, to understand the topic better. So um, I was like, should we, this unpack the standard or should we unpack how to get the ML student to understand the standard and and that that hit my head like I need to be doing that more of uh, more often in my class helping my ML students understanding the topic and not just teaching the topic itself fantastic right aha uh -huh. <laughs> and we need um we need all of our content area partners, you know, to realize that because all of us are contributing so much to the English language development of our multilingual learners. Um, and for me, I'm only with my students once a week, but they're in your classroom, so to speak, uh, every single day. And um, we need you to keep doing what you're doing because you're you're making those great insights and sharing that with with other folks which is what we really need how about our high school folks do we have a representative from 9 through 12. I noticed we had two very active groups going on in the documents so we know you guys were busy All right. Well, I know there are some great insights and I know 912, you're, you're dealing with more complex academic vocabulary. I know that unpacking all of that as far as the language piece and adding that into your instruction um, is extremely powerful. And in the interest of time, I hate to do this. We do need to move on and talk to you a little bit about the connections to our North Carolina multilingual learner initiatives. And we have a few strategies that your English learner or multilingual learner teachers are using that you might want to think about um, because you definitely could use them as well in your classroom. Um, you're going to be seeing uh, some strategies that are directly tied to brain research and as we talked about before, creating those synapses and those uh, firing and wiring is extremely important. Karen, um, will you tell us a little bit more about best practices? Yes, absolutely. No matter what the first language that our students are coming in, I've got in my school, I've got Hispanic, I've got Vietnamese, I've got Arabic uh, going on. And of course, then you've got not just an alphabetic system, but you've got all the symbols and everything as they're learning English. But no matter what that first language is, best practices begins with Stephen Krashen's low effective filter, which is a fancy term just to say you're creating a low anxiety learning environment. When you're not in fight or flight mode, the body can be receptive to learning. So you can create that in your classroom with just a welcoming smile. When our multilinguals come into a new school, there are many phases that they go through. Initially, there may be a honeymoon period where everything is so new and exciting. However, they may end up in a little bit of a culture shock 
as the classroom environment is not quite the same as where they are from or just that listening to a new language day after day can be exhausting. So there's an adjustment period. However, with that warm welcoming environment uh, and appropriate scaffolding measures so that nobody feels like they're put on the spot um, and other supports, the students will adapt. There's much, much, much to read on this. And one of my personal favorite resources I linked here for you, it is um, Oella's EL Toolkit. And it has a lot of just different strategies, solid based strategies. We wanted to give you lots of resources. That's our one of our freebies for the day. Um, and it, Oella is the Office of English Language Acquisition, just in case you didn't know that. Um, and so, Laura, will you tell us about GLAD? Sure will. Um, I am privileged and honored to be uh, a Project GLAD trainer here in North Carolina. Um, Project GLAD comes from OCDE, which is, stands for Orange County, California Department of Ed. So a lot of these strategies were born over 30 years ago on the West Coast. And we, um, through a series of events, um, a lot of this training became available to us in North Carolina. And I kind of hopped on the bandwagon there. And um, some of these are extremely powerful. Here's just a, two of my favorite ones that are um, easy to implement in any content area. Um, if you'll look on the left, this is called a learning log. And um, this is a student example. I was teaching about um, healthy habits and we were talking about, um, you know, your heart pumping and about playing outside and how important it is to get good nutrition and all of that. And so this student um, used a learning log. You see, it's just a simple T-chart. On the left, there's the text heading. And this is just for you to be able to ask um, students a question about uh, what they just learned from your teaching. So this is a great formative assessment after you've just completed some direct teaching, such as a read aloud, a lesson, an experiment, um, whatever it is that you just finished teaching, just pass out these learning logs um, and the student give them a prompt like, how does this connect to what you just learned? Boom. And they can write a sentence and make a quick sketch. On the right side, the you side is how um, does this connect to your life? And that a lot of times that's the prompt that I use all the time. And they um, give some amazing connections to their own lives. And at first you'll have to model this, but after they've done it a couple times, they know exactly what you want them to do. This gives them that time to process exactly what you have just put into their brains. And that will help it to stick a whole lot better. Then on the other side um, of this slide on the right side, you'll see listen and sketch. This is where you can find a text that goes with your unit or your lesson. It could be a poem. It could be an excerpt from a long text or a storybook. And you mark six stopping points ahead of time. Then on the day you're presenting, you ask the students to fold their paper into six boxes and um, number those boxes. And then you're going to start reading your text and ask the students to put their pencil down while you're reading. Then when you get to the stopping point, you're going to say, now pick up your pencil and sketch the picture in your mind. And it's amazing how well the students listen and sketch out what they see in their mind's eye for each box. So there's a link to the solar system poem that goes along with this student example. And I'll just tell you very quickly for box one, the first part of the poem is telling the students that this student fell asleep and they're dreaming about going to space. And you can see how that little quick sketch just um, ties into that beautifully. When you have a moment, look at this poem. This is set to about um, maybe third grade level. Um, and they go through this poem. Also, you can extend this to make this into a writing activity 
Um, there's endless um, ideas for how to use this. You can use it in any content area to reinforce what it is that you're wanting the students to um, learn more. And when you do this, you can hear a pin drop in your room because these students are highly focused on listening, which helps them to really take that information in. All right, and now Karen, if you'll share with us a little bit more about Excel strategies. Okay, thanks, Laura. Excel is a um, a model that was a we in North Carolina adopted years ago from Dr. Marg Margarita Calderon's um, book or uh, research that it stands for expediting comprehension for English language learners. There are three main components, which are vocabulary, reading, and writing. And then each offers multiple uh, research-based proven strategies when used with fidelity to build our um, learners, all learners really, with uh, literacy. So, in this model, um, there's a focus, as I said, with the vocabulary and a pre-teaching vocabulary where the teacher will say a word, the student repeats the new word, and the teacher will say it again. And I usually walk around the room when I'm doing this to hear the students repeat the word to make sure they're pronouncing it correctly. They need at least 12 productions of this new word to be able to really fully own and internalize the word. So that first step is just doing it that three times, listening three times, repeating it three times. So they've got that interpretive and expressive modalities going on for six times. Then they're going to get a dictionary definition. Well, the teacher's going to put it in text. And it's all teacher driven for the first five steps. But then when you get to step six, you've got a sentence frame where the students are going to actually ping pong back and forth with a partner to use that word in a teacher produced um, sentence frame. So then they're actually using the word and then the teacher will share how the, the students are going to be accountable for the word at the end of the day in an exit ticket or something when each content area teacher per uses this model for maybe four or five words each day in a lesson that students are able to exponentially increase their vocabulary which is powerful and then with the reading and the writing strategies they have um teacher read alouds where you're you're reading and then a paragraph you you think aloud what you just thought about that that you just read and doing partner reads multiple reasons to go into text Again, with the ride around, cut and grow, these are all different names and strategies that we're not going to have time to develop here. But I have added a resource link at the bottom of the slide um, with uh, Dr. Calderon's resources where you can print out table tents if you want some of these academic sentence stems and sentence frames. I encourage you to go check it out because they are powerful and they're free. That's another freebie for the day, folks. Um, so, Excel strategies, if you have an opportunity to go for training with Excel, I would highly encourage you. We would like you to be able to share out today what you've taken in with this session um, through the teacher note network um, with our, our Twitter handle, um, NCELD22. Um, we have one more objective to do quickly as we close. So, Laura, I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right, Karen, thank you. So our last objective for today is reflection, um, which is vital to building and cementing your learning. And so I just have one little uh, final thing for you to do in the chat for me today. I want you to think about your lessons that you teach in your area and how you apply the ELD standards that you've just learned about in the chat. Summarize your learning in three words. So those three words that stick out to you from your discovery of the new ELD standards from today. So take a deep meditative breath in and let it out. We've gone over a lot. <laughs> and what three words come to you? Okay, Lauren says express, evaluate, inform. 
Stacy, vocabulary is important. <laughs> yes. Clarity, commitment, collaborate. Commitment. I love, I love that because mm -hmm. we are committed to each student. Absolutely. Connections, empowerment, clarity. Already prepared activities. Jennifer's still reveling in that. <laughs> that it's already Stephanie. done. <laughs> From Stephanie, breadth, depth, and um, specificity. I love that. Intentionality and planning. Nice. If you like that, you, that is that is glad and excel all the way. <laughs> All right, keep those, keep those coming in the chat. This will be saved. You, we will be able to um, save this chat for you and link it later. Did we meet our objectives today? Let's look really quickly. Thank you. We became acquainted with the purpose format contents and location of our new ELD document. We gave some ideas for how to use this resource. Thank you. And um, we reflected on our practices. As we did our artifact, we promoted research-based standards aligned practices with um, the activities that you did, and you were able to create an artifact that will promote future application. When you come back to this in the fall, you have got something to be come back and refer to. So what we would like you to do now is to help us help you. We really do value your feedback. We look at your feedback. Please take a moment. Um, we've got about three minutes left. If anybody wants to unmute and ask a question or or um, make a comment, but we do have an evaluation of this session. Please use this. Um, be sure to put the title of our session in your evaluation. It is unpacking the the ELD standards. So if you will note that when you're completing your evaluation, that would be. Um, very helpful to know specifically about feedback for this session. Also, since we are in the last minutes and seconds of this session, we would love to invite you to come back this afternoon from 3.30 to 4.30. We will have office hours where you can meet with Laura and I personally, and um, you just can come back to this presentation and click on the join us link here um, between 3.30 and 4.30 this afternoon. And we would be happy to talk further with you then. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. And as Stacy pointed out in the chat, you don't need to register for office hours. Just come and click on that link here in this presentation. And don't forget to um, choose the unpacking the ELD standards in your evaluation. We really appreciate your cooperation, your participation, your wows, wonders, and everything else today. Um, we were so happy you took your time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you. Yes, and summer. Summertime is precious time. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Feel thank free you. to email us with any questions or ideas or Maybe you want to learn more about some of the things that we shared, and we would be glad to share with you. Yes. Thank you. And also, if you would like more PD brought to your district, um, feel free to contact one of our uh, Title Three team members or NCDPI reps, and um, we can bring PD to your district. And again, thank you, Stacy, for facilitating today and being present with us. The PD name is Unpacking the ELD Standards. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming.
We should have the happy music playing. <laughs> oh. Great session. Great, mm -hmm. great participants. That was mm -hmm. wonderful, meaningful engagement. Um, Rebecca's asking, is there a GLAD strategies training? Yes. yes. <laughs> Laura is one of our famous instructors. Email me. I'll put my uh, email in the chat. 